Hi folks, Matt Eaton here of Scholar Gladiatorial. Now I'm here today at Olympia Auctions and hopefully you've seen my other recent videos. So there's an upcoming sale on the 26th of June, link below. And I'm getting to get my hands on loads of amazing original artifacts that are in this sale. And one of those that I'm gonna be looking at today is a probably Spanish, we'll talk about that in a second, Montante. Now Montante is the Iberian word for a big two-handed sword. And this is big, it's a 120 centimeter blade. But don't think it's heavy or unwieldy because it's absolutely not. This thing handles like an absolute dream. It's really, really lovely in the hand. Now, um, full disclosure, I must mention that this has at some point received a broken blade that has been restored. So this is a reattached uh, end, roughly 28 centimetres of blade at the end of the blade that's reattached. But nevertheless, otherwise, it's completely original and very, very nice, I have to say. So this is a... 16th, 17th century example of a Montante. Now they're actually quite, if it is Iberian, they're quite difficult to date because strangely enough, the uh, Montante or two-handed sword came around in 16th century um, Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, and was used for very specific purposes. Now those of you who are familiar with Hema and historical fencing will know that we actually have Montante treatises surviving um, which teach us how to use these things, um, particularly with solo forms, but also against multiple opponents. And that's very much how they were intended to be used. So these were often used by bodyguards or they were used by elite troops. Now, many of you will know about the Landsknechts. Now, the Landsknechts, um, basically of the Holy Roman Empire, did indeed use big two-handed swords, but not usually of this exact style. But their use was somewhat similar. So they were essentially elite shock troops. They were paid extra. They were expected to take risks that other people wouldn't take. But the Spanish particularly used them for bodyguarding important people, um, uh, defending things like bridges or alleyways or places where you, as a sort of last ditch defense or places you wanted to hold the enemy. They were also used against multiple opponents where the, um, where the enemy outnumbered them. But additionally, interestingly, I think for me anyway, they were used on the top of galleys of ships. Um, now galleys are powered by rowers, as you probably know, and rather than in the ancient period where they have a ram on the front, in this period, they usually had a large um, firearm, a large cannon on the front. And this was used, instead of ramming, this was used to shoot into the side of opponent ships and possibly then to ram afterwards as well. Um, but galleys were vulnerable to boarding by larger ships with larger crews. And so the top of the galley, which is uh, essentially like a deck, a bit like an aircraft carrier, they could put soldiers, and in some cases, projectile weapons on the top of the galley. And one of the things they therefore also put on the top of galleys were people with big weapons like this, like this two-handed sword, or indeed things like pikes and halberds and things like that. So these are useful anti-boarding weapons. So often when we talk about naval weapons, we think about things like cutlasses and boarding pikes, but you should also think about the Montante. So the Montante, a fascinating weapon that we even have instruction manuals surviving for how to use in a variety of scenarios. Now, a characteristic feature of the Iberian Montante is that they often don't have a lot of extra handguards. So when we look at German or sometimes Italian um, two-handed swords, they often have side rings, double side rings. Um, sometimes they have those big kind of extra horns here. We do have little ones. And this particular form with a relatively simple cross guard, relatively simple pommel, most pommels tend to be fairly simple on two-handed swords, a long simple grip with no you know, tassels or anything in the middle, simple cross guard, and two little projections here, we'll talk about those in a second, without them being big spikes. That suggests that this is probably Spanish. Now, what could it be if it's not Spanish? Well, it could be Portuguese, or indeed it could be Southern Italian. Now, one of the reasons why there's a lot of cross-pollination of weapons between Spain and Southern Italy is the fact that Naples and, and the whole of the south of Italy was under an enormous amount of Spanish influence at this time, as were the Netherlands. So, for example, when we go later into the 17th century, we find Spanish-style cup-hilt rapiers being popular obviously in Spain and Portugal, but also in the Netherlands and also in the south of Italy. Anyway, so this could be Italian, uh, but it's probably Spanish in my opinion and according to the um, auction catalogue as well. So you'll see that the blade is essentially um, double-edged and fairly parallel all the way down. It is a cut and thrust blade. Obviously it's pointy so you can thrust with it, but it's def definitely not a dedicated thrusting blade. It's definitely a cut and thrust blade. 
And it's um, remarkably well balanced and remar remarkably nimble for its size. As I say, the blade is 120 centimeters long. And if you're anything like me, you'll want to know about the distal taper because distal taper tells you a lot about how a sword feels in the hand. And it is nine millimeters at the base of the blade here. Maybe it, actually it was a bit more than that, about 9.5 if I remember correctly. So 9.5 millimeters here. It's around 7.5 millimeters in the middle of the blade. So it's really thick still, but it's down to 3.5 millimeters down here. So essentially we do have a non-linear distal taper. It's it's thick, but not humongously thick at the base of the blade, but it maintains a lot of thickness. But bear in mind, it's not a hugely wide blade at the middle of the blade. And then from the middle of the blade down to the tip, it has a lot more distal taper. So in that sense, it's like some of the military sabers we've looked at on my channel, where it uh, has a lot of thickness at the base, keeps some thickness to the middle of the blade, and then it suddenly sheds that thickness down to the tip. And of course, the result of this is in mass distribution. The mass is in the first half of the blade with a relatively light tip of the blade. And that's why the sword feels so lively and maneuverable in the hand. It's a really, really beautiful piece. And there are a few decorative things about this sword that I really, really love. I love the um, incised engraving on the pommel, really, really detailed but also not too precise. It's quite organic and quite uh, liberated. Um, but also, we, I love this kind of shell feature at the center of the uh, cross guard here. And the terminals, we just come up there, the terminals to those, look at that, beautiful little spirals. And then with the incised lines on alternating parts of that spiral, it always, almost looks like some kind of sweetie you could pluck off and eat. And one of the absolute highlights of this has to be those little dog head, I think they're maybe dogs or bears, that's difficult to tell, on the end of those terminals there. I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous. Look at those. They're so cute. And they do the job. And, and what these are for, incidentally, if you're not aware, is for stopping an opponent's blade that slides down here. So if a blade slides down the opponent's blade, instead of coming all the way down to the cross guard, whereby if it came over the cross guard, it would stand a good chance of hitting your thumb or fingers. Instead, it stops on this bar up here, which of course uh, means that it's kept further away from your hands. So just having those is like a secondary cross guard. It keeps it a lot, lot further away from your hand. And the other thing worth mentioning as well, in case you're not aware, is many of these two-handed swords have a utterly blunt bar-like ricasso at the base here. So you can grip the blade down here quite easily should you want to for any sort of purpose. And one reason if we look at Morozzo, for example, he uses a sword not dissimilar to this actually. If we look at Morozzo, one reason that you might want to hold a sword like that is if you're fighting against a pike or spear, whereby if they're thrusting at you, you can hold the sword that way around. And as you cross the thing, then close in, run close in and use the thing at close range. Essentially, quite like half sorting uh, found in earlier treatises. So it makes it a very versatile weapon, not just against other two-handed swords or other swords, but also against pole weapons. And one little detail while I was talking that I just want to show you is that this does have edge damage from other blades. I don't know if you'll be able to see that on camera, but I can assure you that it has absolutely unmistakable on both sides, there particularly, it has a little notch, you can probably just about see there, little notch that is absolutely unquestionably from another blade. Now, of course, we don't know if that was done in messing around, if it was done by children at some time, or if it was done actually uh, in combat. But I can tell you that this sword still has a pretty sharp edge and um, uh, it is a single bevel. There's no secondary bevel. So this is particularly up at this end of the blade where it's quite thin is going to cut really, really well. It's a, just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. Anyway, you can find out more about that in the description linked below to the auction. And um, thanks to Olympia Auctions for letting me to get my hands on this. Thanks to you for watching and hopefully I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks.